watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Seven inmates break out of a high security prison in New Mexico. State and local police call in the FBI. They begin a desperate search to find these dangerous men. The escapees, all violent criminals, threaten the public and terrify the community. Investigators must capture these men before they rob, rape, and kill again. In 1987, the New Mexico Penitentiary housed hundreds of violent offenders, rapists, killers, men that juries put behind bars to protect society. On July 4th, seven of those men escaped. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. It was one of the worst prison breaks police and the FBI had ever faced. For the innocent people caught in the prisoners' paths, it was the most terrifying ordeal of their lives. The North Unit at the Penitentiary of New Mexico outside Santa Fe is a level six facility. Open up B3. It houses some of the state's most violent offenders, armed robbers, rapists, and murderers. Convicted killer William Gilbert is the assigned janitor for his cell block. Gilbert, July 4th, 1987, is Independence Day. He forces his way into the control room. Gilbert releases six other inmates. They join him in the control room. The inmates climb a ladder to an emergency hatch that leads to the roof. They take one of the guards with them as a hostage. Inmates walk along the roof, searching for an exit. They are looking for a spot where the perimeter fence meets the building entrance so they can jump to the ground. Once they get down, they handcuff the guard to a fence and disappear into the night. quickly frees himself and goes for help. Prison officials are stunned when they realize several dangerous inmates are now on the outside. Somehow, Gilbert got a gun inside the prison. He managed to get past the unit's security in less than two minutes. Because of budget cuts, there was no guard in the tower overlooking the roof area where the men escaped. Also, the security sensors on the roof were not functioning. The prison officials have no idea if the inmates were aware of this or if they just got lucky. The prison goes into lockdown. The 
Officials begin a search of the immediate area around the prison. The escapees only have a 15-minute lead. The warden calls the New Mexico State Police. They want the roads sealed off and every officer on the lookout for the escaped convicts. Not certain how many escaped, guards conduct an emergency head count. They find seven inmates are missing from the North facility, home to the prison's most dangerous inmates. Next, the entire prison is searched to determine if any of the escapees are still hiding within the prison complex. The seven men are nowhere to be found. Storage area is clear, going to second location. Local police and sheriff's departments are given the inmates' descriptions and warned to be on the lookout. Prison officials brief investigators from the New Mexico State Police. Former Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. We have to develop an investigative plan, a public notification plan, and an apprehension plan, and they all have to be working simultaneously. If we fail to do them in an appropriate manner or in a timely manner, the, res the results could be devastating. The prison is 14 miles from the heart of Santa Fe and several residential areas are within a few miles of the complex. Investigators fear the inmates are desperate enough to resort to violence. The prison staff identifies the seven escapees. William Gilbert is a four-time killer. His death sentence was commuted to life in prison when New Mexico abolished the death penalty in 1986. James Kinslow is a serial rapist and killer. At the age of 22, he was sentenced to three life terms. David Gallegos is serving a sentence for armed robbery. Robert Davis is a former police officer turned armed robber. John Schmidt, Hector Torres, and Michael Romero are all violent criminals serving lengthy sentences. The New Mexico State Police assigned David Osuna as the case agent. I could hear the other people from the Department of Corrections saying, oh no, it's Jimmy Kinslow, oh no, it's William Wayne Gilbert, David Gallegos, probably the most notorious and dangerous individuals at the penitentiary of New Mexico. Deputy Warden Keith Norwood. They're serving life sentences. What do they have to lose if they are outside the perimeter of fence and within the community? They had nothing to lose. <laughs> The time factor in, in catching a, an escapee is critical. You have 24, 48 hours to catch these individuals. After that, there's a good chance that they've gotten outside of your perimeter. As minutes turn to hours, state and local police expand the search area to a 10-mile radius around the prison. Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police at the time of the breakout. We went into each cell and brought out clothing from each of the escapees, and we sent them with the dog handler. And they would go out in the perimeter of the facility and start seeing if they could pick up a trail. The immediate need was to apprehend and recapture these individuals before they used any sort of violence against our citizens. The stress level for us in the law enforcement uh, arena was, was considerable. This was one of the most um, intensive searches that I've ever participated in. We had individuals on three-wheelers running around. We had people on horseback. I mean, if there was a way to search for, for these inmates, we'd look for it. The state police had a, a chopper flying around, and it had a flare with it. FLIR, forward-looking infrared, is a special camera mounted underneath the helicopter. With that flare, they were able to locate body heat off of the ground. Police helicopters coordinate with search teams on the ground. We could provide immediate response to any potential sightings. In the absence of sightings, we identified areas where we thought individuals could be uh, hiding out, conducted searches. We'd move tactical teams uh, into those areas to conduct foot searches. We had different teams 
starting a house-to-house -house search in the near areas of the uh, penitentiary. And then there were other teams that were following up on the leads, the people that were calling in, the suspicious people, what have you. Near the prison complex, canine units pick up the escapees' trail. They were able to maintain a scent trail until they crossed Interstate 25, and then they lost it. At the edge of the interstate, the trail stops cold. For law enforcement, it's an ominous sign. If they got a gun into the facility, then more than likely, they planned on a vehicle. To escape on foot here in New Mexico, it's kind of difficult because there's not a lot of water. There's a lot of cactus. There's snakes. There's just all kinds of stuff that run around here at night. The Corrections Department, New Mexico State Police, and Sheriff's Department had a series of predetermined roadblock locations that in the event of an escape or an emergency would be manned in, in a certain order. Law enforcement expands the search area and calls in officers from all over New Mexico to man the vast network of roadblocks. Not only do we have the state police, but the city of Santa Fe City Police Department, Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department, we have different uh, tribal officers here. We have Tusuke, Pohuake, uh, San Ildefonso, Santa Clara, uh, Santo Domingo, I mean, these all encompass Santa Fe County. And then I believe that we also also pulled in officers that were currently in class at the New Mexico Law Enforcement Academy. We basically had an inner perimeter of roadblocks and then an outer perimeter of roadblocks, just in the event that they somehow got past the first group. For law enforcement, the pressure is building. If these escaped killers are hiding out in the residential areas around the prison, no one is safe. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, seven men convicted of robbery, rape, and murder break out of a maximum security prison. Investigators suspect the mastermind is William Gilbert, a four-time murderer. Seven months before the escape, Gilbert had his death sentence commuted by the governor. When an inmate escapes, they're looking to get out and never come back. Former New Mexico State Police investigator David Osuna they may do just about anything to keep from being apprehended again. And that includes uh, the possibility of murder. Authorities need to make the public aware of the danger. I've never heard of a correctional officer being shot. And it was just my opinion that they'll shoot anybody to get away. The governor authorizes the use of the National Guard in the fugitive hunt and gives a shoot-to-kill order to police searching for the seven men. Investigators know that the physical search for the escapees is only part of their task. They need intelligence. Authorities pour over the fugitives' records. We're gonna look at the segregation logs. We're gonna see how many phone calls they've made. We're gonna see who they've been associated themselves with. Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. The institutions keep volumes of records. Anyone on a visiting list, anyone that's come into the institution, when individuals were moved from cells, where they went during the day, can all be located in one form or fashion. It takes time, but you can find those records. Right now, it seems the escaped inmates have every advantage. These people have time on their side in terms of planning and strategizing and putting these things together. Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police. But as we know, the best conceivable plans always have something going wrong. So we were hoping for that human element to present itself. Investigators believe at least one other person must have helped the inmates escape. The weapon that the inmate had, how did it get into the facility to begin with? Could there have been another accomplice that maybe was employed through the correctional facility. We didn't know, but we knew that the weapon gained or entered into the facility somehow. They also suspect someone close to the inmates must be helping them now, possibly family or friends. They're gonna need to change the clothes. Uh, they're gonna need food. They're gonna need transportation. Um, they're gonna need a means to communicate. We have to know early on 
if these inmates are going to contact somebody, who would it be? It doesn't take any sort of sophisticated analysis or evaluation to know that it's probably going to be family members that are going to step out on the limb and risk their own freedom to try to help out a loved one. That's kind of the common denominator and one that we're going to look at uh, immediately. Investigators compile extensive lists of people associated with the escapees. We wanted to know exactly who was visiting with who and to find out if maybe if it's another inmate that they showed particular interest in, maybe their family members. So we tried to expand that net as much as we could without depleting resources to the point where you reach the point of diminishing return. It's a huge undertaking. The FBI joins the search. <coughs> Former special agent in charge of the Albuquerque FBI office, William Branner. What we can do is any out-of-state leads that are developed as a result of this investigation, uh, no matter where they are in the country, we can have an FBI agent on scene within an hour or two to conduct the interview or to gather the information. At the prison, state police investigators question the inmates, but they have to do it carefully. Timing was very important when you interview inmates. It's a different world. Everybody's timing everybody else. They're watching. If you spend more time with one particular inmate than you do with somebody else, the first question they're going to ask, I wonder why. Did he divulge any information? And their life is on the line. We had a timer set up, the inmates would come in, we'd talk to them for 20 minutes, and regardless of where we were in the conversation, we'd send them back. The inmates of the North Unit say they were not aware of the escape plan. These guys kept that plan pretty confidential. And for inmates not to know things what's going on, especially in their pod, that's pretty unusual. Investigators also questioned prison personnel. They learned that days before the breakout, guards confiscated copies of state police and prison radio codes from Robert Davis's cell. Hours after the escape, guards made another surprising discovery in Davis's cell. Aeronautical charts and maps of Mexico. Was that truly part of a plan to take a plane, to hijack a plane? to drive to Mexico? Or is it to send us off in a direction 180 degrees from where they're really at? We sent an officer over to the airport in Santa Fe. State police ask airport security to be on the lookout. Bob Davis, although he's an inmate at the facility, is a very intelligent individual. This was not an escape of opportunity. It was well planned. High-risk individuals, they were highly motivated. Investigators need help and appeal to the public. They want the local people to call in if they see one of these individuals. Police release the fugitives' mug shots and rap sheets to the press. And more importantly, they need to know how dangerous these individuals are so that they don't allow them in their houses, don't assist them in any way. They were our eyes and ears. They started airing footage on the history of each of the inmates. Thousands of calls overwhelmed police hotlines. Anybody who saw anything unusual in Santa Fe or within 40 miles of Santa Fe were calling the police departments or the Crime Stoppers hotline reporting suspicious or unusual activity. While investigators sort through tips, they work to close off every avenue for escape. Santa Fe was uh, completely locked down. I mean, uh, everybody from the governor on down was exceedingly concerned about this. Uh, the whole state of New Mexico was concerned about it. The residents of Santa Fe are terrified. Because they're constantly living in a state of fear that somebody might break into their house, somebody might cause harm to their family, somebody could be killed. It was just my opinion and the opinion of the investigators that these inmates were still in the Santa Fe area. We felt very strongly that they had not escaped our perimeters. Two days after the escape, a homeowner in Santa Fe reports a break-in at his house. 
Police find a prison jumpsuit. The find indicates that some or all of the inmates may still be in the Santa Fe area. Then on that same day, two miles from the penitentiary of New Mexico at a local racetrack, a security guard makes his rounds. A security guard who was on his toes saw this individual walking through me, the racetrack. Come here, come here, where are you going? Come on over here, sir. He confronted the individual, and after a quick discussion, realized this was probably one of our escapees. He was able to handcuff the guy, call local officials. New Mexico State Police identify the trespasser as Hector Torres, one of the seven escaped inmates. With one captured, there's always the possibility that the other ones are close by. One inmate has been found. Authorities dispatch a SWAT team to the racetrack to search for the other six convicts. If the other men are hiding at the track, police have them cornered. But that is when these men are most dangerous. Outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico, seven convicts escape from a maximum security prison. One man is in custody, and SWAT teams search a racetrack complex for the other six escapees. There is no sign of the remaining fugitives. Investigators' only lead to their whereabouts is Hector Torres, the man they captured. Where are the rest of the guys? Carlos Maldonado was a criminal investigator with the New Mexico State Police. When we interviewed him, he said he walked for hours. Didn't know where he was going. Just continued walking and walking and walking. And uh, he said, before I knew it, and he was so fatigued, he was tired, he wound up back at the penitentiary. Torres claims he knew nothing about the escape before Gilbert plan? opened his cell. There was no plan. He just knew that he was free for the moment and took advantage of that. According to Torres, four inmates stuck together. Gilbert, Davis, Kinslow, and Gallegos. But the rest pretty much just scattered in different directions. Investigators suspect these four prisoners planned the escape. Gilbert only released Torres, Romero, and Schmidt to distract law enforcement. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. It was a pretty good thing to do as far as the ringleaders were concerned because they would put these people loose and out there and who didn't have a plan, who didn't know where they were going to go. This would certainly occupy law enforcement in running these individuals down. Three days after the escape, police believe six of the inmates are still somewhere near the Santa Fe area. Armed robber Michael Romero and violent offender John Schmidt. Four-time murderer William Gilbert. Armed robber and former cop Robert Davis. Serial rapist James Kinslow and robber David Gallegos. The men pose an incredible threat to the citizens in the area. There was no doubt in law enforcement mind that, uh, that there were going to be home invasions and that these people, they had to seek food, they had to seek shelter, and they had to seek transportation to get out of the area. On July 7th, authorities' worst fears are realized. In a suburb of Santa Fe, a teenager babysits her young cousin. She looked out the window and saw a man coming to the house. She was so paranoid, as everybody was in Santa Fe. She was able to call the police to, to say that somebody suspicious was approaching. One of those guys is trying to break in. Oh, no, he's trying to break into the window. Oh, no, no, he's at the door. He's at the door. Please come, hurry. Put the phone down! Put the phone down! Incredibly, the intruder only steals a bag of bread, then flees. Police arrive quickly. Investigators ask the teenager if she can identify her attacker. Former New Mexico State Police investigator David Osuna. This young lady identified 
David Gallegos as one of the escapees who broke into her house. SWAT teams converge on the area. Law enforcement officers searched every home within a mile radius during that time looking for the escapees. Gallegos and the other five fugitives are nowhere to be found. When you get a call like that, and the idea is that these inmates have broken into a home and they're taking clothes and food, that means they're trying to change their identity as an inmate. They're trying to uh, mix in with the general public and maybe go to a restaurant or do whatever some of the local people do. But they're looking for a way to get out of the Santa Fe County area. The next day, there's another sighting. 85 miles south of Santa Fe, a highway patrol officer sees something strange on the back of a flatbed truck. When he pulls the truck over, Yo, let me see your hands. a man slowly. is hiding on the back. Slowly down, slowly. Come on down. Hands up. Get on the ground. Get your hands out in front of you. It is one of the escapees, former police officer turned armed robber, Robert Davis. All right, tell me about the New the Mexico phone. State Police questions Davis. What are you going to do from there? The interview with Bob right Davis now, was know, instrumental in breaking this case wide open. What Bob was able to tell us is how this plan developed from the initial stages all the way to the escape and where probably the other three important escapees we're currently at. According to Davis, Gilbert, Kinslow, and Gallegos are hiding out together. As police suspected, a relative of David Gallegos is helping them. This relative was gonna take him to a storage facility here in Santa Fe, where they would be housed until the roadblocks were down, and then a relative of David Gallegos would once again meet them, bring them to Albuquerque, and they would make their escape all the way to California. Former New Mexico State Police Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. But I think there was a sense from the investigative team and the management team that the information wasn't exact, but it was credible. Based on Davis's statement that the men planned to cross state lines, New Mexico State Police contact the FBI. Ultimately, I think the FBI found that there was enough information that the individuals might have left the state of New Mexico, then giving them federal jurisdiction. The FBI decided to file an unlawful flight to avoid confinement complaint. This is called a UFAC complaint. The FBI's UFAC casts a dragnet across the nation. Agents around the country are now on the lookout for the convicts. The manhunt intensifies. In New Mexico, investigators turned their attention to trying to find the storage unit. According to Davis, it was rented under a fake name and address. Agents and police searched the records of every storage facility near the airport in Santa Fe. They checked the names and addresses in the files, all of which are valid. The fact that we couldn't find Gilbert Kinslow or Gallegos indicated to us that they probably had some type of help and somebody was hiding them in the Santa Fe area. Agents and state police trying to find out who is helping the fugitives investigate the people closest to them. The FBI tracked them down, found their locations, determined what type of people they were, whether or not they had could have been involved in assisting the people in the uh, prison break. And we eliminated a lot of these people as probably not having been involved, but we came up with a handful who we thought might have been involved. Uh, have you heard about the and among them was Gallegos' brother-in-law. The different agents, including myself, found themselves in Albuquerque a lot, interviewing members of the David Gallegos family. According to Gallegos' brother-in-law, he has not been contacted by the fugitives. He has no idea where they are. Investigators suspect he is lying. Several more days go by. The roadblocks stay up. Hundreds of officers continue to search for the remaining five fugitives. 
Even if it's true that three of the escapees are on their way to California, two remain somewhere in the Santa Fe area. July 11th, seven days since the breakout. A 17-year-old girl is house-sitting in an exclusive neighborhood. She has no idea she is not alone. Two gunmen suddenly appear. They demand the teenager's car keys. Mark, did he hear nothing? He see nothing. She notifies the Santa Fe police. As an officer responds to the scene, he spots two of the fugitives coming straight at him. 410 vehicle spotted in pursuit. The officer swerves just in time. Fugitives aren't so lucky. You would think that both of them would get hurt and injured because it was a good crash. It wasn't just like a little fender bender. Michael Romero was captured, but Schmidt is able to run from the scene. He's hiding somewhere in the neighborhood, possibly injured, and desperate to do whatever it takes to remain free. In New Mexico, three prison escapees have been recaptured. Four are still on the run. On the morning of July 11th, a Santa Fe resident notices a blood trail leading to his garage. He notifies police. The house is in the neighborhood where Michael Romero was arrested and John Schmidt disappeared the night before. Officers follow the trail of blood to the homeowner's garage. Put your hands where I can see them. There, they find John Schmidt. This individual was uh, arrested in a garage near the governor's mansion in downtown Santa Fe which caused a little bit of a stir. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. After the first four individuals had been apprehended, the only people on the loose were Gilbert, Kinslow, and Gallegos. They are the three most dangerous escapees. Four-time murderer, William Gilbert, serial rapist, James Kinslow, and Robert, David Gallegos. But nearly three weeks after the escape, the investigators are running out of time and money. Not only had the main players not been caught, but now we were looking at a great expense in keeping these roadblocks up and using the manpower that were available. So finally, a command decision was made, pull the roadblocks. David Osuna of the New Mexico State Police questions Robert Davis again. Davis sticks to his story. He was insistent that they're here in Santa Fe and that they're at a storage shed. You know, and, and obviously, I believe them. Agents and police continue following the only lead they have. So please step behind the vehicle. They take another look at all the storage facilities in the Santa Fe area. We finally end up at this one storage facility off of Airport Road. All right, ready? Let's go. Now! Nothing! At this facility, investigators find that several people occupied one of the units for an extended period of time. Nothing. Investigators find a tiny hole drilled through the concrete wall of the storage unit. And they could actually see, uh, although it was a very small hole, traffic going by, people going by, and talking, what have you. Lieutenant Mark Radosevich. The agents did check that particular location repeatedly, went through the records, but there were some cards that had been inadvertently stored in another file cabinet that were not provided to the agents on any of their visits. Again, we were that close. The discovery of the storage unit confirms the agent's suspicions that the fugitives are receiving outside help. We felt that someone had to have contact with that group. 
Investigators surveilled the remaining fugitives' family members. Former New Mexico State Police criminal investigator Carlos Maldonado. We use a technique where it's not aggressive, but it's obvious, obvious surveillance. Well, they look out the window, they know that you're parked out there. Yeah, he's on the move right now. And it's to raise the stress level uh, so that hopefully mistakes are made. Agents set up pin registers, a device that enables them to track the numbers of all incoming and outgoing calls on the phone lines of a select number of the fugitive's associates and family members. We had a pin register installed on a particular individual and uh, on the 21st day, that individual received a call from a motel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We sent an FBI agent and a state police agent to that motel. They show the desk clerk photos of the remaining fugitives. Yeah, I have seen The desk clerk recognizes the three men. She says they checked out of the hotel a few minutes ago. Police and FBI agents search the area. There is no sign of the fugitives. We recognize that we, Wayne Gilbert, and Jimmy Kinslow and David Gales had probably left the state. We didn't get any more tips, no phone calls, no nothing. Investigators believe California is a likely destination. They know Gallegos has relatives there. And recaptured escapee Robert Davis mentioned California. Authorities contact police agencies and FBI offices in California to be on the lookout for the three men. They believe the three fugitives are traveling together. Authorities most fear Jimmy Kinslow. They just knew or felt or believed that because of his background, being a stone-cold killer and rapist, that he was going to do that again. The FBI's fears are justified. In Arizona, Kinslow has already identified a victim. Seven inmates make a daring escape from prison. Only three escapees remain free. They are heading west, and one is taking hostages. Convicted murderer and rapist Jimmy Kinslow forces his way into an Arizona home. He demands to know if there are any guns inside. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. He obtained several handguns, a shotgun, and I believe four rifles. So now he's very highly armed. He forces the entire family into the car. Kinslow orders the father to drive from Flagstaff to Barstow, California, a 350-mile trip. In Barstow, he holds the family hostage in a motel room. Three hours later, he leaves the motel. He takes the couple's 11-year-old daughter with him. He leaves in their car with the 11-year-old and leaves the area. The mother and father are able to free themselves from their being tied up. Get the quick. Oh, hurry, please. They notify the Barstow Police Department. Barstow Police immediately contact the FBI. He's got my little girl. The FBI responded uh, to the area and began looking for the car that uh, Kinslow was using. Former special agent in charge of the Los Angeles FBI office, Bucky Cox. The fact that Kinslow now uh, was on the loose with an 11-year-old girl notches this up considerably. Uh, there, there is no type of case in law enforcement that gets law enforcement's attention more than the possible harm to a child. 
Agents and police searched the streets, looking for the abducted family's van. Two hours later, they get an incredible break. The 11-year-old girl approaches a police car in Garden Grove, California, 115 miles from Barstow. All right, hold on a second. Step back. She tells the police officer she was abducted in Flagstaff, Arizona by an escaped convict along with the rest of her family. What's happening? The kidnapper drove her around for several hours before dropping her off behind a restaurant. And says to her, you stay here. I'm going to come back. If you're gone, I'll find you. Well, as soon as he left, she disobeyed that order and walked out to the street and flagged down a patrol car. She gives police an accurate description of Jimmy Kinslow. According to the girl, the kidnapper is still driving her father's car. She tells them she overheard him making plans to meet friends at a trailer park somewhere nearby. Garden Grove police spread out and searched the area looking for the abducted family's car. They quickly spot it. Garden Grove didn't approach that vehicle. They backed off of it to establish the surveillance to see if they could catch someone coming to that vehicle. They backed off in such a manner as not to tip anybody off that they were in the area and had any interest in that vehicle. An FBI SWAT team sets up a forward command post in a strip mall two blocks from the trailer park. We didn't want to be in a position where we could be observed by anyone who might be going to that vehicle or have anything to do with that vehicle. Garden Grove detectives maintained surveillance on the van. All of a sudden, an excited voice came across the radio. The lights are on in the van, and, he's, and it's fired up. I mean, somebody had started the van, turned the lights on, and seconds later, the van is moving. It's rolling. It's backing up. They pull out in pursuit. Investigators thought the vehicle was empty. Apparently, Kinsler was inside all along. The convicted murderer and rapist is finally in their sights. The FBI had to make a decision. Did they want to follow the car, see where it took them to, to try to capture Gilbert and Gallegos, or should they immediately arrest Kinsler? They made the absolute correct decision and decided to immediately take down Kinsler. FBI agents and Garden Grove police converge on all four sides of the vehicle. He's got a van in front of him. He's got uh, FBI behind him. I think there's a Garden Grove patrol car behind him. Put your hands up. Hands up. I'm actually coming the opposite way and turn in towards the side, so he has no place to go at this point. Kinslow is outmanned and outgunned. But police fear this ruthless murderer will not go down without a fight. In Garden Grove, California, agents and police have dangerous fugitive Jimmy Kinslow cornered. Investigators fear they are in for a fight. Let me see your hand! Let me see your hand! Jimmy Kinslow finally gives up. Get down! Come on, come on. Get up! You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say it cannot will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to have an attorney. You can't afford one. One will be appointed for you. Investigators search the fugitive's car and make a chilling discovery. Former special agent in charge of the Los Angeles FBI office, Bucky Cox. We looked down, and there was a 357 Magnum pistol revolver that was laying on the floorboard on the driver's side. Investigators find additional weapons in the back of the vehicle. Kinslow is interrogated at the Garden Grove Police Station. Agents need to know where the remaining two fugitives are. Okay. The, more you help the us police the turn up the pressure. 
Although Kinslow has nothing to lose, he starts to talk. Former FBI special agent in charge, William Brannan. There's no honor among these guys. Kinslow's told us where Gilbert and Gallegos were. According to Kinslow, the last two fugitives are staying at a motel in Garden Grove, California. He doesn't know the room number, but he can describe the room's location. Kinslow agrees to draw a sketch of the motel and of the room. And then he also tells us that another family member is there that had helped uh, Gallegos and Gilbert and actually brought them to the motel. Gilbert and Gallegos are on the second floor. The family member is in the room directly beneath them. From their command post two blocks from the motel, the FBI decides whether to raid the rooms. The fugitives are armed, they have nothing to lose, and the motel is full of innocent people. That's a sketch that I drew based on information we could get, in law enforcement terms, burned. They'll, they'll spot us, and now we've got a, really a dangerous situation on our hands. Conversely, if we hit the wrong room, then it's gonna wake up the whole neighborhood and we've got a dangerous situation on our hands. So we weighed the options. It's a risky operation, but losing the fugitives is even riskier. The FBI decides to raid the motel rooms. So here we had two separate rooms, one where the remaining two escapees from New Mexico are located, and the other one where the people who assisted or facilitated the escape are staying. Let's do this thing. So what we decided is we are going to do a SWAT entry on the room with the two fugitives, and we are going to do basically a knock and announce on the room down below as soon as the flashbang goes off. At 6.30 a.m., an FBI SWAT team forcibly enters room 243 at the motel. No knock was made. The device called the flashbang was thrown in. It immediately disorients whoever is in the room. William Gilbert and David Gallegos are quickly taken into custody. Don't move! Inside the motel room, agents find two sawed-off shotguns and a revolver, along with a large quantity of ammunition. I think once these uh, three individuals got to the motel, they probably figured that uh, they had pulled it off and that they were going to get off scot-free. But not so, because technology and law enforcement caught up with them. All seven fugitives are finally back in custody. It was an exhilarating experience when they were caught because the team had done their job. It was great. On July 31st, 27 days after the escape, the last of the fugitives are returned to the penitentiary of New Mexico. Their breakout had been months in planning. To this day, no one knows how Gilbert got a gun inside the prison. After the escape, New Mexico built a new prison with more modern security features. Thanks to the hard work of the New Mexico law enforcement agencies and the FBI, Michael Romero, Robert Davis, John Schmidt, and Hector Torres face additional charges. William Gilbert, Jimmy Kinslow, and David Gallegos will spend the rest of their lives in prison. <laughs>